Bernardo, buenos días. Buenos días. Muy buenos días a todos desde Paraguay. Buenos días. Buenos días, señor presidente. Buenos días a todos. ¿Todos? Buenos días. Perfect, doctor Grigal. Hello. How are you guys? Hola, buenos días. Muy buen día desde Ciudad de este Paraguay. Hola. Profesor Borba, buen día. Hola, buenos días Leonardo? para todos. ¿Todo bien? Sí. Doctor Guillermo está acá. Sí, sí, buenos días a todos. Buenos días a todos. La presentación va a ser en inglés, porque hay otro, los dos que no hablan español, el doctor, el doctor oh. Lorenzo, el doctor Grillo. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Uh, we'll be in English. I think, I think uh, okay. Grigual, because uh, his relationship with Alfredo Quiñones speak a little bit Spanish, or not, Grigual? <laughs> yeah. Professor Very Lorenzo. Cool. Just, just the things involved with drinking and uh, hanging. <laughs> Leonardo. Usted podría cambiar el nombre del profesor. Yes, I'm, I'm changing Lorenzo right Bello, now. Que está, está con tu nombre. <laughs> It's my clown, Doc. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm changing. Hola, bueno, Nalino, Tornalino, ¿cómo está? ¿Todo bien? Muy bien, doctor, gracias. Sí, sí, gracias. José, ¿cómo estás? ¿Cómo está? ¿Cómo está, Manuel presidente? Gadea, ¿cómo estás? Fernando, saludos. Bien, Juan Antonio, vos. Buen día. ¿Cómo? Hola, Luis. Hola, ¿todo bien? ¿Cómo están todos? Leonardo, gracias, saludos, Borba. Hola. Saludos. Fernando Martínez, ¿cómo está? ¿Todo bien? ¿El mate? Ya tengo, doctor Borba, buenos días. Fernando, ya está en la hora del mate. Todo bien, todo bien. Y Uruguay empieza con el mate, termina con el mate. Ah, claro. Sí, señor. Doctor Portillo también, en hora del mate. Como debe de ser, ¿no? Como debe de ser. Sí, estaba un frío, llegó un frente frío importante a Paraguay. Ah, sí, no me digas, acá también, ¿eh? En todos lados hace un poco de frío, pero acá estamos un friazo de 20 grados. Doctor Soriano, muchos saludos. No, ya me voy a en Colombia. ¿Cómo estás? Saludos, Ortiz Portillo, abrazos. Doctor Soriano, doctor Borba, buenos días, buenos días con todos. Buenos días. Buenos días. Acá, tenemos, ¿Cómo estás? Acá, acá tenemos a mucha gente. Miros, buen día. Buen día, doctor Soriano. Buen día. Doctor. Ramiro del buen Valle, día. saludos. Buen día. Leonardo, buen día, doctor José. Buenos días, buenos días. Buen día. Buen día. Bueno, pues vamos a, a iniciar porque son las ocho y una de las características de la de la Federación Latinoamericana de Sociedades de Neurocirugía es tratar de ser muy puntuales con los horarios a fin de aprovechar el tiempo y también con la finalidad de, de que el resto del día lo podamos disfrutar con la familia. Hoy es un día de fiesta para nosotros porque eh, dentro de la Universidad Flank el sábado, temprano, acá son las, la madrugada de las 8 de la mañana y ya tenemos 211 asistentes hasta ahorita y seguramente aumentará con el transcurrir de los minutos. Pero Hola, buenos días a todos, perdón. Hoy tenemos, hoy tenemos la, la gracia de iniciar con los cursos de inmersión que son un complemento muy poderoso al programa ya de por sí bastante ambicioso de la Universidad Flank y tenemos eh, un primer tema que es eh, imperativo que todo neurocirujano conozca, gliomas. Hay muchos eh, casos de gliomas y muchos casos complejos, especialmente la toma de decisiones ha cambiado drásticamente y hoy nos movemos entre el ámbito oncológico y el ámbito funcional, y eso es lo que vamos a tratar el día de hoy. Así que, sin más, 
Les agradezco mucho su asistencia, les deseo muchas bendiciones. Espero que todos ustedes estén bien junto con sus familias y le voy a ceder la palabra al doctor Luis Borba eh, para que nos haga favor de conducir el programa. Yo voy a salir unos minutos porque tengo que dar una conferencia, pero regreso en un breve rato para estar con ustedes. Muchas gracias. Adelante, doctor Borba, jefe. Go ahead. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, doctor Soriano. Gracias a todos por la asistencia. Con Gabriel Vargas. Hola, mi doctor Soriano. Hola, Gabriel. Saludos. ¿Cómo estás? Primer... Hola, Bien. profesor primer... Borba. Hola. En el primer sábado de que estamos haciendo la programación de La Flank, la, la Flank está todos lo, lo, los miércoles con ustedes, pero el primer sábado que hicimos la inversión. Y un tema muy importante, traemos gente mucho más importante que el tema. Gente que hoy en el mundo son las personas que más hacen, un, que trabajan mucho con esta área y hacen un trabajo muy reconocido en todo el mundo. Primero el profesor Ileme Rivas de Brasil, posteriormente el, el, el doctor Lorenzo Velo de Italia y para finalizar el profesor Griewald from Jacksonville eh, de la Clínica Mayo. Un gran honor para nosotros tener acá. Esta, esta, esta presentación está también en el Facebook, en el YouTube. Creo que tiene más como 50, 60 personas en las otras plataformas y va a estar grabada para que todos puedan asistir después. I'd like to start in inviting a great friend and great neurosurgeon from Brazil, Professor Guilherme Ribas. Professor Guilherme Ribas is an and neurosurgeon in chief of the hospital, Israelita Hospital Albert Einstein in Brazil. He also professor of, uh, of anatomy and topographic anatomy in the University of Sao Paulo. Many years ago, the people start to talk about anatomy, to study anatomy, but one guy came with one idea. The idea is to bring the technology to learn the anatomy. What's the best technology to us to learn anatomy? The 3D, the possibility to see all the image in 3D at home or sometimes in the papers. And Professor Guilherme Hiba had this great idea and he published in the Journal of Neurosurgery the first article on 3D. I remember you have the article and the glass together and you could see in 3D. After this work of Professor Ribas, all the world, all the people, especially Professor Albert Rotto, start to do the papers and the publication in 3D. A great idea for a great man, the man that studied anatomy, a great neurosurgeon, and a great friend. Thank you very much, Professor Ribas, to thank your time for us. Please, go ahead. Thank you so much, Professor Rivas, and enjoy it, please. Uh, can you see my uh, my slides? Yes, perfect. perfect. Yes, Professor. Okay. okay we well, initially, I want to thank my good friend Borba for his kind words, oh. and. Uh, want to also thank uh, all flying colleagues for this unique opportunity, which where I'll be talking about how to use some anatomy guidelines, anatomy landmarks, as our guide to operate on the cerebral, particularly lobar lesions today. We all know that the advent of um, microneurosurgery turned the suicide not only in the main landmarks of the brain surface, but made them also possible microneurosurgical corridors. But we also all know that uh, it's very difficult to identify the brain suicide during surgery, not only because they are covered by arachnoid and by vessels, but mainly because they are interrupted, most of them, and because they have some anatomical variations. Of course, nowadays we have technology, but many of us throughout this world, particularly to our, our Latin America, don't have all this technology. And sometimes technology doesn't work. Sometimes technology doesn't work fine. And 
above all these things, of course, technology cannot substitute our anatomical knowledge. So we are left with anatomy. Now, in order to understand this anatomy, the particular anatomy of the cortical surface, we have initially to remember that the cortical surface was developed throughout phylogeny evolution and throughout our embryological development, throughout an unfolding process that took place at the same time that the brain itself was bending around the center, around the center, which is the thalamus. Given this process, we have, of course, to understand that the soci and the, so the fissures, which are the main soci, are extensions of the subarachnoid space. Now, while some important sources like, that, like the superior frontal sulcus, for example, of the superior temporal sulcus are mostly, in, uh, are mostly continuous sulcus, many, many sulci of the brain are interrupted. For example, the inferior frontal sulcus is always, always constituted by two or three segments. So number one, we have to understand the sulci of the brain as concepts. It's not, not as very well defined spaces, subarachnoid space. We have to understand them as concepts, as anatomical concepts. In the same direction, of course, the cortical surface is continuous at the, around, uh, along the depth of the sulci, but it's also continuous around the extremities where the sulci end. So the gyri of the brain are altogether a continuum, a completely continuum. So again, concepts. We have to understand the brain gyri as arbitrary regions, as anatomical concepts. For example, the very important in front of, uh, inferior frontal sulcus is constituted by these three important convolutions that we're talking about. So please understand sulci and, 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 and gyri as concepts, as arbitrary concepts in anatomy. We have to work with them, of course, and then they have anatomical variations. Now, it's very interesting to mention that until very recently, the brain sulci and gyri were understood as being completely disorganized, as in this beautiful illustration of Vicens, the great man that described the white matter fi fibers, the central, the corona radiata and the internal capsule itself. They understood until very recently that this was completely disorganized. It was only about 160 years ago that Louis Pierre Graciolet described this organization of the suicide and gyri that we all know today. I'm not going to talk about today this organization. I'm gonna to talk today how to use this in, in surgery, but I'm sure that you neurosurgeons all know this basic organization that was described by Louis Pierre Graciolet. Given this enfolding process I talked about, very important to have in mind two very important neurosurgical features. All the suci of the superlateral surface of the brain and the basal surface of the brain are always leading us towards the nearest ventricular cavity. But this is very important because if we go along an important suci, we are going towards the nearest ventricular cavity. This is not true for the medial surface because the suci of the medial surface are dependent on the development of the corpus callosum. That's why they are parallel to the corpus callosum. Another important feature for this unfolding process is that the projection fibers, that very important projection fibers, why they arise mainly from the crest of the gyri, the bottom of the soci are related just with U fibers as you can see in any very simple white matter dissection. So this is very important because if we go to a soci or just next to a soci, at least theoretically, we'll be sparing Directly, we'll be sparing more the more important functional projection fibers. The suicide can be used in many ways in surgery. We're not, we're not gonna talk about details with this. It can be used just as simple anatomical geographical landmarks until microneurosurgical corridors in very different ways, as you can see here. But coming back to the difficulty of recognizing them in surgery, we have to rely in neurosurgical anatomy, and particularly in the relationships of the brain surface with some bony landmarks, what was called craniocerebral topography. Pierre Paul Broca is the father of this very, very important chapter in neurosurgery, but many other authors followed him, 
with different methods, with different uh, descriptions of different relationships, as you all know. It's very interesting to go along the history of these relationships. Well, but while the soci have some variation also regarding the cranial cerebral relationships, we all know that some important points, particularly the extremities of the soci and, and or the meeting points of important soci have a more constant anatomy. So we call these points, which were many of them already described by Broca, Paul Broca and other authors and some other points described by us as this two one that we're gonna be talking about. We call them microneurosurgical neurosurgical so key points because they are very important for us to have them in mind. We did study the so key points, not only in relation to the cranial vault, but also in relation to the deep structures of the brain and with the ventricular cavities. The initial, the main study was with 32 specimens and then we did other studies. Uh, the, the, the error of the studies was always less than two centimeters, most of them less than one centimeter, which is an error good enough for us to place a craniotomy. Our main idea was for us to understand any given lesion in the brain in relation to this important, the nearest so-called key points. So we could understand where it is in relation to the skull. With this, our objective was where to place our craniotomies after understanding the lesion in relation to the so key points and to ease our identification of the soci and use them as anatomical landmarks or as microneurosurgical corridors. These uh, studies are published in important papers, very too easy to uh, find under our name. Now, in order to use the soco key points, we have to have in mind just two very simple important relationships because we're gonna be using the sutures and many times the sutures are not easy to be palpate. Very easy to palpate the nasium at the base of the nose here. The distance from the nasium to the bragma that we're gonna be using very much is only thir about 13 centimeters in the adult. And more 13 centimeters, we are at the lambda. And then we're gonna be talking about the pistocranium also, about the inium and other points along this, uh, this lecture. So just remember that the nasium to the bragma, about 13 centimeters in the adult, and more 13 centimeters, you reach the lambda. Just have this in mind. Well, I also start with the so-called silver point that was the Skyper of Frodiap in the 19, end of the 1900, because the silver point is the prototype of what we call a microneurosurgical key point. Nowadays, we call the silver point the anterior silver point, because as we're gonna see, be seeing later, we have the posterior silver point described by the Yasser The anterior silver point is very easy to be understood because the pars triangularis is always more retracted. So we recognize the anterior silver point as an enlargement of the fissure. So when we go to the fissure and we see the anterior silver point, the anterior silver point divides the feature, the, 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 huh? the, the lateral fissure of the brain in two important branches. The most important, the, the, the anterior one, which is the anterior branch or sphenoidal branch and the posterior branch in the lateral branch. And from the anterior sylvan point, you always have two branches arising from the sylvan fissure, the horizontal branch and the anterior ascending branch. Of course, these two important branches, they delineate the pars triangularis, which is usually more retracted and you give this cisternal appearance of the anterior sylvan point. The pars triangularis always have this small branch coming inside, coming from anterior to posterior inside the pars triangularis. We believe that we were the ones that described as a small branch here. Anterior to it, you have the orbital part and posterior to it, you have what I call the most beautiful U of the brain surface, which is the U-shaped convolution, which is the opercular part. The opercular part of the inferior frontal sulcus, in my understanding, is the most constant anatomical convolution of the brain, as you're gonna be seeing, I'm gonna be showing many specimens. And it's very, very important that it always, always, always harbor inside it, the distal end, the inferior end of the precentral sulcus. So it's very much easier to recognize initially the precentral sulcus than the central sulcus, because the precentral sulcus always end inside this beautiful U-shaped convolution here, as you're going to see many different spaces. All this, of course, from the simple anterior sylvan point. 
So if you come to the surgery, as you see every day, you have this cisternal aspect here. This is the anterior silver point. Professor Yasaji you always point that you have this two small veins here getting together. And this is, from here you have the anterior, the horizontal branch and the anterior ascending branch. As Professor Yasaji says, the more you know, the more you see. So you have to know and you have to believe when you see. So of course, this is the pars triangularis here more retracted. Of course, this is the pars orbitalis. And posterior here, you have the beautiful U of the opercular part with the precentral sucus here. So just by recognizing here, you, remove, you recognize the anterior part of the opercle. Now, underneath the anterior serum point, a point in anatomy is not a point in geometry, it's an area. So this is a huge, this is a lake. An anterior serum point is very huge. And you see the beautiful U and going to point, always constant, always harboring the precentral sucus. So this is precentral sucus, this is central sucus. Well, underneath the anterior silver point, you always have the apex of the insula. Always, 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 always. And very important because running underneath the apex of the insula, you have the uncinate fascicle anteriorly and you have the IFOF posteriorly. So just by seeing the apex of the insula, you know what is underneath. So if you open the fissure, sometimes the apex is a little bit flat, but you know that just underneath here, you will have the uncinate fascicle here and you will have the IFOF here. So important, very important landmarks from the simple exposure of the anterior seven point and recognition of the anterior seven point. Regarding anatomical topography, it's very well known that the coronal suture starts a little bit far away from the anterior to the precentral sucus, but then it, it gets closer to the, to the precentral sucus, getting inside the pars opercularis, as I'm already pointing. You see another brain here, you see a beautiful U, very constant, precentral sucus, anterior seven point, pars triangularis. Where is the anterior seven point in the, in the skull? Is just at the beginning of the squamous suture. This is the squamous, this is not squamous suture. This is sphenoidal temporal suture. This is the pterium region. We're not gonna be talking about it, but this is the beginning of the squamous. Suture. This is where the anterior seven point is underneath. Now, let's see how you can use the anterior seven point just to recognize. This is a, this is a, a surgeon from Bahia, Brazil, had a previous uh, posterior temporal GBM was removed. After two years, he came, unfortunately, with this, what we would call a frontal opercular lesion. But if we see better this lesion, we see that it's sitting in the anterior part of the insula. And if we think anatomically, we come from the, from the, from the, from the, the lesion itself and come superficially, we see that the lesion is pretty much underneath the pars triangularis. You see here, beautiful U, pars opercularis, precentral sucus, always going to show you this because this is very easy to understand. And from here, you understand everything. This is central sucus, central lobe is very quadrangular just by understanding, seeing this U-shaped convolution. But we see, you understand that your lesion here is just underneath the pars triangularis. And in anatomy, you have to know that if you remove the pars triangularis, you're going to be showing up, you're gonna be exposing the most anterior short gyrus of the insula. So in this case, nowadays we can go to the neuro, to the neuro, 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 neuro image suite and, 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 and study the next day case we're gonna be doing. Beautiful you, pars opercularis, precentral sucus, pars triangularis, and a beautiful anterior silver point, that's what we're gonna be seeing in surgery. So the more you know, the more you see, you see here the anterior sylvan point, very large cisternal area of the sylvan fissure. And you see here, sitting over it, of course, the pars triangularis. The pars opercularis is posterior. So you see here the small branch we described coming from the inferior frontal sucus, from anterior to posterior, getting inside the pars triangularis. And you see here the pars opercularis with the precentral sucus. Again, the more you know, the more you see. This is pars opercularis. This is part triangularis. So our, our lesion is sitting just underneath here. You don't need technology. Of course, you have to have it and you have to use it. You have to double check. But in this case, if we remove this, this is the part triangularis. This is right side case. We didn't do this awake. And then you expose the lesion. Simple anatomy. Simple anatomy and a very elegant anatomical surgery. Of course, 
and then you remove the surgery that was sitting in the anterior short gyrus of the insert. Now, there are two other very, two other very important soco key points related with the frontal opercle. One, you see here the inferior frontal sucus always interrupted the beautiful you, the pars opercularis, where the inferior frontal sucus meets the precentral sucus. Usually when two important suci meet, you have an enlargement of the subarachnoid space. This point meeting point is very important because it's showing us the precentral gyrus here, where is the face, the, 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 the face representation. And it's the, the upper part of the opercular part that of course is very important, particularly in the dominant hemisphere. Where is this very important point, okay? This very important point is just behind what Broca called the Stephanion, which is the point where the coronal suture meets the superior temporal line. We expose this every day, superior temporal line and coronal suture, just posterior to it, you have the meeting point underneath, you have the meeting point of the precentral sucus with the precent. The, the inferior frontal sucus with the precentral sucus. Now, another very important point is where the central sucus will project in the fissure. We call this the inferior landing point. You know that the precentral sucus gyrus is always connected with the post central to this connection here that was called the inferior frontal parietal connection of Broca. Nowadays, regarding Yasagio uh, nomenclature and onus, metil onus nomenclature. We call this the subcentral gyrus, okay? So where the, in, the central sucus projects in the fissure, we call this inferior prolendic point. Where is this inferior prolendic point in the skull? It's just underneath the most superior part, the upper part of the squamous suture. If you come with a with with vertical line from your preauricular depression, I'll be showing this later, four centimeters, you are at the upper aspect of the squamous suture. So that's where the inferior from the well, if we open the silver fissure now, we see the superior, what we will call the superior uh, surface of the temporal lobe, that it's also called the opercular surface of the temporal lobe. You see the, this, this beautiful transfer gyrus, which is our most, the biggest transfer gyrus we have in the brain, that of course is the transfer gyrus of Heschel. Transverse gyrus of Heschel, the primary auditory area, divides this superior surface of the temporal lobe in two planes. One oblique anterior that of course is called a polar plane and a posterior one that is very flat, always triangular with this apex just next to the atrium that is the temporal plane, is the temporal plane. So if you see here more in large, you see here the beautiful transverse gyrus of, West, of, of, of Heschel, and anterior to it, you have this oblique plane, which is the polar plane. And posterior to it, you have the flat plane, which is the temporal plane. So always think anatomically. If you see a coronal, a coronal view in the MRI, where the fissure is oblique, of course, you are anterior to the Heschel gyrus. If you see already the fissure flat, of course, you are posterior to the Heschel gyrus, in, within the temporal plane. Always see, so just by seeing this, you have to know where a lesion is, just by having this very important anatomical tip. Now, another very, very important feature of the Heschel gyrus, you see here the Heschel gyrus, always going posteriorly to the insula, to the so-called central core. The, the, in the surface, the Heschel gyrus always, 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 always have this bulging here, always have this bulging. And the post-central gyrus is always sitting over this bulging. The post-central gyrus is always sitting in the Heschel gyrus. Let's see again, beautiful you, pars opercularis, pre-central sucus, central sucus. So this is post-central gyrus, always sitting in the Heschel gyrus. And that's how neuroradiologists identify the Heschel gyrus. They see this bulge. And just by seeing this bulge, you know that this is the post-central gyrus. It has to be because it's always sitting in the Heschel gyrus, post-central gyrus. And of course, this is the quadrangular aspect of the central lobe. And then from this mark here, they identify the beautiful Heschel gyrus, transverse gyrus of Heschel. And again, now topography, you see this big bulging in this specimen here is just posterior to the inferior landing point. 
just posterior to the inferior landing point. And of course, this is the post central gyrus sitting in the in the hesiod gyrus. And of course, you have just posteriorly the supramarginal gyrus. So you see normal anatomy here. You see the bulging of the the the, the, the hesho. This is post central. This is precentral. This is quadrangular central gyrus. Of course, this is opercular part. This is precentral sucus. You see how much you can identify just by knowing anatomy. And of course, you have here a tumor at the post central gyrus because you hear, you have here the supramarginal gyrus, precentral, and you have the opercular part. Of course, if this tumor is in the post-central gyrus, of course, this tumor is sitting over the flat aspect of the surface of the, of the fissure. So just by seeing this single image here, you have to know that this tumor is sitting in the temporal plane. So let's operate on this patient. And let's see, just by exposing the squamous suture, how much we can see of the brain. Let's come back here. This is what I call the preauricular depression, where you can palpate your temporal pulse. Very palpating yourself, very important point. We hope to get to the end of the talking about this, this point again. If you go four centimeters superior vertical here in the adult, you have the most superior aspect of the squamous suture. This is where the inferior lengthy point is. So the central sucus is right here. If you go two, three centimeters superiorly, anteriorly, you have the anterior sylvan point. So in you, in you go just posteriorly to the inferior landing point, you have the bulge of the hesho gyrus here. So just by seeing this, I'm seeing the whole operculum here. This is very, very important. While the squamous suture in the anterior half runs over the sylvan fissure, from the inferior landing point posteriorly, the sylvan fissure go up and the squamous suture goes down. So just by seeing the squamous suture, you can see the whole frontal operculum. Inferior landing point, hesial gyrus, two, three centimeters, 2.5 centimeters anteriorly, anterior sylvan point. So we expose, of course, very easy tumor to expose, but the more you know, the more you see, and you have to know where you are. So you know that your tumor is in the post-central gyrus, sitting in the temporal plane. So this is all pre-central gyrus. This is the inferior landing point. If you go more anteriorly, you have the anterior sylvan point. You see here, the more you know, the more you see pars triangularis. You see the beautiful you, the pars opercularis. You see because you know, you can see the beautiful you here. So you know this is pre-central sucus. This is pre-central sucus. If I lift here now, I can see the cisternal aspect where the inferior frontal sucus meets the pre-central sucus. And of course, the pre-central sucus ends inside the opercular part, the beautiful you. So you identify the whole operculum without neural navigation, without nothing. This is anatomy. And of course, you have to stimulate dominant hemisphere. We operate awake patients and everything. And in this case, just at the bulky of this GBM in this lady in the dominant hemisphere. <clears throat> Another very, very, very important point, sucral key point where the superior frontal sucus, that it's always a beautiful, very deep sucus, usually most of the time continues, where it meets the precentral sucus. The precentral sucus is always interrupted, always, because all the three longitudinal frontal gyri are connected with the precentral gyrus. The most superficial and big connection, of course, is of the middle frontal gyrus, with the precentral gyrus. You always have this big connection here. Of course, it's interrupted the precentral. The medial one of the superior frontal gyrus with the precentral, which is within the SMA area, is more medial. Usually, you don't see here in the surface. But let's come back to this important point here. Superior frontal sucus meets the precentral sucus at this point here, that it's always anterior to this beautiful omega region here where you have the hand representation. So this point is very important because you have a lot of SMA area tumors, gliomas. If you put insular and SMA tumors, low-grade tumors together, they are more than 50% of low-grade tumors. This is very important area. This is where I have most of my, my cases of, uh, of, of low-grade gliomas and also high-grade gliomas, as you know. So when you operate this area, you don't want to get inside the precentral gyrus. 
of course, then you have to recognize, you have to start in the sukkus. You have to identify, if you go to the sukkus, you're gonna identify, this is very constant. You're going to identify the superior frontal sukkus. And where is this? This is just until 1.5 more, almost two centimeters behind the coronal sutures and three centimeters laterally to the, to the bregma, to the, to the, to the sagittal suture. It's always within this area here with a less than one centimeter error. So let's operate anatomically this case here. This is old case. I didn't have near navigation at this point and uh, I didn't operate as much as a wake patient as I do today. But uh, this tumor has its epicenter in the superior frontal gyrus. Does it comes to the middle frontal gyrus? We don't know. Professor Yasajil says that even high grade tumors, they remain in a compartment for a long time. The single eight gyrus, it seems to be connected here with the tumor. It seems to be infiltrated by the tumor. But let's see anatomic. We have a tumor that it's in the in the in the in the in the superior frontal gyrus. So we plan this anatomical removal here, just as I was going to, uh, to, to remove a parasagittal meningioma. You have to expose the central, the, the, the sagittal sinus. Because if you lift a little bit of bone here, you're going to be covering at least half of the superior frontal gyrus where the tumor is. So just as an meningioma, as an aneurysm, you have to expose the superior sagittal sinus. Don't have to be afraid of it. And you see the coronal suture? We know that three centimeters laterally and two centimeters posteriorly, you have the point where the superior frontal sucus will meet the precentral sucus. So I don't want to go posterior to this. I want to work in the superior frontal gyrus anterior to this. And again, the more we know, the more you see, you see a sucus here. So you know that this is superior frontal sucus. So this is superior frontal gyrus. It's very, very common for a vein to be running over this main suicide here. So I know that this vein is running in the inferior, in the precentral sucus. Now this point here, this point down here is where the inferior frontal sucus we meet the precentral that I told you about just behind the Stefano. Now you're never going to recognize very well the inferior frontal sucus because inferior frontal sucus is a concept. It's three, two or three segments, always interrupted. But this point is very constant. This point is very cool. Now, superior frontal sucus, you're going to identify always. It can vary, but this point here where they meet is very, very constant anatomically. And it's just posterior, as I said. So in this case, I want to operate this region. I'm in front of the motor strip and I want to remove anatomically the superior frontal gyrus in this case. So I open the superior frontal sucus. You see how deep it is? Open the superior frontal sucus, how deep it is. And then I go to the callosum. I see the singular gyrus here. Singular gyrus seems to be spared. So what do I have here? I, now I, I was able to open the singular sucus. The more you train, the more you do. In this case, I was able to do. And I see that the singular gyrus is not with tumor. And in this case, I was able to do an anatomical removal of the superior frontal gyrus, okay? Just leaving the cingulate and leaving the middle, the middle frontal gyrus that has no tumor. A radical removal just guided by anatomy landmarks. Very easy if you know this very, very simple landmark and you train dealing with the suicide. Now, this is a very normal insular tumor, okay? And you see how insular tumors, they, uh, tumors in general, they like to open natural spaces. And you see that this tumor here is open the anterior sylvan space, the anterior sylvan point. Of course, but it comes from the insula, it goes where it, is, it opens natural spaces. So you have this insular tumor. You see here the beautiful uh, exposure of the tumor opening the anterior sylvan point. You see here, look at the opercular part. Opercular part, precentral sucus. You see that the tumor is open the anterior sylvan point. We used to do this case at this time mostly to the anterior, to the Sylvan fissure. Now, most of them we do through the operculum, but we did through the Sylvan fissure, we opened. We did a quite removal, but you see, we, we left a lot of tumor superiorly here, that we were not able to lift more this dominant frontal operculum. 
Now, if you see an atom, you can, you can go again here, you can nowadays operate awake and remove the perculum in order not to leave this residual here. But at this point, if you look anatomically here, you see that this tumor is pretty close to the superior frontal sulcus, pretty close. So in this case, I decided to go to the superior frontal sulcus in order to reach the superior aspect of the tumor from here and just where it meets the precentral sulcus. And from here, you see that I was able to do a quite good removal. Patient did fine. And you see a late removal here that I was able to go to the tumor and remove the superior aspect of the tumor just by thinking anatomically. I believe that nowadays this case would be operated awake and we would uh, be able to remove this part of the perculum and not leave the residual. But the message I wanna show here is that you always have to look at MRIs anatomically. And sometimes you can be creative in doing a very different approach depending. And that's what's interesting in operating gliomas. You can use your creativity because you can use your anatomical knowledge and it's very different. One case is very, very, even a high grade. I enjoy very much operating on GBMs. Now, Broca described the relationship of the superior landing point. This is central sulcus. You know that inferior landing point is just above the superior, most superior aspect of the squamous suture. And where is the superior landing point? Where the paracentral lobule is related with the interhemispheric fissure. Broca showed already that this point is just about five centimeters posterior to the bregma. Very easy. So you have always, of course, to have this in mind. The superior landing point is five centimeters posterior to the bregma. So you go from here to the superior aspect of the squamous suture, you know where the squamous, the, 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 the central sulcus is. Remember that the inferior landing point is four centimeters above the preauricular depression, just where you palpate your temporal pulse. So very easy to see. And this is 13 centimeters from the nasal. So this is 18 centimeters, about 18 centimeters from the nasal in the adult. So always have in mind where the central sulcus is. And usually it is more posterior than we usually think. So we have this patient here that has an, had a non-enhancing lesion to start at the post-central gyrus. You see here, this is the second beautiful U I want you to have in mind, the paracentral lobule. Sec, always this beautiful U here, harboring the central sulcus here. You see the cisternal aspect where the superior frontal sulcus meets the precentral sulcus. So this tumor is sitting in the post-central gyrus. Isn't the post and after some months, she's very, very, very young. But after some months, unfortunately, the tumor started to enhance and she was sent to us and she had a high grade glioma exactly in the postcentral gyrus. Beautiful you of the paracentral lobe, second beautiful you of the brain here. So in order to expose this region, anatomically, I have to know where the superior landing point is because from here, I'll know where the central sulcus is. And of course, I'll find my tumor. Five centimeters posterior to the bregma, okay. And then you expose this, the, I, I like big exposure, you expose the bregma, five centimeters posteriorly, superior landing point. If you, if, if you have the highest aspect of the squamous suture, you have the central sulcus here. So I know that my tumor will be sitting here. And of course, use near navigation. I'm not against, I, I love it, near navigation. I use also, also for subdurals also, but know where you are and check your nerve navigation because sometimes it's not working this well. Okay, and then in surgery, of course, do your neurophysiology. Nowadays, we would definitely do this patient awake. I operated a, a pre-central gyrus big cavernoma about two weeks ago, and we did them awake and everything was fine and use all the functional modalities you have. We're gonna be having Professor Lorenzo Bello, which is the, the top in the world regarding uh, stimulation, brain mapping, particularly of the motor strip. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very distinguished opportunity to have him here at this uh, seminar. And then you can open the central sulcus if you don't coagulate any vessels, okay? And in this case, we were able to do a very nice uh, radical removal of this lesion. She did fine, fortunately, and she did live pretty, pretty much, she did live four years and a half was a very brave lady. She had a baby in between, uh, although knowing what, uh, what she had. 
Pareto region is a little bit more com complicated. It's not very linear as we have in the frontal region, okay? In the Pareto region, we're not talking about brain details of suicide here, but always remember that you have the interparietal sucrose, very, very deep sucrose, usually continuous, but it can, it can be, it, 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 it can be uh, uh, discontinued by a, a connection here of the inferior frontal lob parietal lobule with the superior parietal lobule. But important to know that intraparietal sucrose is always, 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 always continuous with the postcentral sucrose. Always. In postcentral sucrose, go superiorly. Sometimes you have an interruption of a connection of the superior parietal lobule with the postcentral lobule. So use the postcentral sucrose, it's, it's interrupted at this point here. And of course, interparietal sucrose separates the inferior parietal lobule from the superior parietal lobule. Superior parietal lobule is the quadrangular area that medially is continuous with the precuneus. Inferior parietal lobule is constituted by the supramarginal gyrus and by the angular gyrus, and is separated by the intermediary sucus of Jensen. Not talking about this anatomy, but while the supramarginal gyrus is a very well defined gyrus regarding its morphology, the angular gyrus usually is not beautiful as in this horseshoe. Uh, uh, shape as you see here. Usually is, 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 is very, is a region. You have to understand the angular right gyrus as a region and not as a well-defined structure, just as any other gyrus in the brain. Where does the, the precentral gyrus end and start the subcentral gyrus? This is definition, is in between the two subcentral gyrus of, 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 of the insula here, or the subcentral gyrus of the fissure. So this is all definitions, okay? Understand? Anglogyrus gyrus is this region here, just posterior to the intermediary sucus of Jensen. So a very important sucral key point here is where the intraparietal sucus, which is the mo most variable important sucral, is not linear. You see the superior frontal sucus, this is another space always parallel to the intermediary tissue. The, the supramarginal is variable regarding its inclination in regarding to the interhemispheric feature, but it's always continuous with the postcentral. So I know this is postcentral gyrus, postcentral sucus. So this is postcentral gyrus. This is precentral gyrus. Postcentral gyrus has to be sitting in the actual gyrus here. You have to have this configuration in your in your head. So where does the Professor, your microphone is off. Okay, can Sounds you okay. hear me? Okay. Yes, okay. yes. So this transition point of the intraparietal with the postcentral is six centimeters anterior to the lambda and five centimeters laterally. And this has a two centimeters error because this inclination of the sucrose is very variable. But you can place a craniotomy with the two centimeters error. The other very easy and very important sucral key point in the parietal region, one of the sucral key points I use mostly, particularly to drain subdural hematomas, is the most prominent point of your parietal bossa. Palpate your parietal bossa here, and the most center, the center of a parietal bossa, Broca called the eurium. Eurium in Greek means the faraway, the most far, the faraways. So he called this the eurium. The eurium is always, always, always sitting over the anterior aspect of the supramarginal gyrus. Always, 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 always. So very two very important so-called key points. Let's use them to operate this tumor. Always start in this normal side, identify, of course, this is intraparietal. This is longitude, you know, this is parietal. This is intraparietal. And you know that intraparietal is continuous with the postcentral. So this is supramarginal and this is angular. This is postcentral gyrus. This is precentral gyrus. This is anatomy. If you come to this side, you see the tumor is in the filial parietal lobule. And if you come here and you see that the tumor is restricted, confined inside the supramarginal gyrus, you see that the region of the angular gyrus is preserved here. I'm not talking about suicide, but you have to know that the superior temporal sucus, its most distal part gets inside, ends inside the angular gyrus. This is supramarginal gyrus tumor, supra confined, as Professor Yasaji always says, inside this compartment. So I didn't have neuronavigation. This is an old case. 
I want to remove anatomically the supramarginal gyrus. So I'm going to see the supramarginal, the, inter, the intraparietal sulcus, continue with the postcentral. I have to know where is the end of the fissure, because the end of the fissure, which is the posterior sylvan point, is going to show me the connection between the supramarginal and the, 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 the superior temporal. Just for you to remember here anatomy, the superior temporal gyrus is always continuous with the supramarginal. The middle temporal gyrus is always continuous with the angular. And the inferior temporal, inferior temporal gyrus is always continuous with the inferior occipital that goes around the corner is continuous with the lingual gyrus. This is a basal ring we have in the brain. So coming back here, superior temporal gyrus continues with the supramarginal. I'm going to remove this anatomically. Let me just come back here. You know that aurium is going to be always sitting here in the anterior aspect of the supramarginal gyrus. So if you, ex this is the aurium, the most prominent aspect of the, this is parietal bossa here, parietal tuberosity or bossa. If you come from the back of your mastoid tip vertically here, you, you, you reach the aurium. So just, if you like to do a small incision, here the tumor is, okay? Here is the, 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 the I did my calculation. Here's where the interparietal sulcus is turning into the post central. I'm seeing this anatomy here. And this is the end of, this is the inferior landing point, four centimeters superior to the periauricular depression. So the end of the fissure is right here. So going to do my craniotomy. You see the top of the parietal tuberosity. This is the anterior aspect of the superior marginal gyrus. So this is the anterior aspect of the tumor. And here it is, okay? You see the tumor here, the more you know, the more you see. Again, a big vein running along the intraparietal sulcus. I see a, a sulcus in here. So this has to be the intermediary sulcus. This is the end of the fissure. So this is angular region, angular gyrus region. This is supramarginal gyrus region. I wanna remove this anatomically. So at this point, I already did open a sulcus. I didn't open brain here. Intermediary sulcus of Jensen. This is, I'm sorry. This is what I opened, the end of the fissure. So this is the connection of the superior temporal gyrus with the supramarginal, just right here, coming from here. So I know where I am. Now, I'm, I opened the intermediary sulcus. I'm holding the intraparietal sulcus. You see how deep it is? I know that the tumor is not in the in superior parietal lobule. This is another compartment. This is another compartment. So, and I go along the intraparietal sulcus, towards the post-central sulcus. I know this is continuous. And then I can do an anatomical removal of the supramarginal gyrus. This is non-dominant hemisphere. I would be doing this awake if it was today in the dominant hemisphere. I don't think I would do it in, in the non-dominant hemisphere, but this is a long, uh, another discussion. And you see that beautiful resection anatomical of the supramarginal gyrus. You see the post-central gyrus, you see the pre-central gyrus, you see the central sulcus. You know that this is the beautiful you, the pars opercularis, a very well retract pars triangularis. This is pars orbitalis, frontal parietal opera. Occipital region. In the occipital region, of course, remember that you have the calcarine fissure ending here at the most prominent posterior aspect of the brain. And you have the parietal occipital fissure here or parietal occipital sulcus. Of course, you have the cuneus and you have the precuneus continues with the paracentral lobule. And you have here the lingual gyrus is continuous along the corner, around the corner with inferior frontal sulcus. Now, if you see from above, you see a beautiful incisure here. And you see again, this is the second beautiful U, paracentral lobule. This is the third beautiful U, okay? This is the parietal occipital connection of Graciolet. Parieto occipital, and this is the parieto occipital incisure. What is this incisure? This incisure is exactly the depth of the parieto occipital sulcus. So the parieto occipital sulcus is so deep that you always have this incisure. So this is precuneus, continues with the superior occipital gyrus, and this is cuneus. I'm sorry. This is this is cuneus. This is cuneus. This is lingual gyrus. This is Calcan fissure right here. This is lingual gyrus and this is cuneus. Okay. Guess what? Broca showed that this incisure here, this incisure, this is another specimen. The incisure again is the depth of the parietal occipital fissure. 
Broca showed that this point is exactly in the angle that there is between the sagittal suture and the lambda suture. Exactly here. If you expose this angle, you are into parietal suture here, parietal sucus. So precunius is here, cunius is here, lingogyrus is here. You see how easy this is. Second occipital important key point. If you give me five minutes, I'll finish the lecture here. Okay, most prominent aspect of your occipital bossa now. Of course, this is the end of the calcum fissure. So let's operate on this lady. She had had a previous GBM here, completely removed, step protocol. After two years came with this uh, amyanopsia, uh, right amyanopsia. And she had this tumor that part of the tumor was in the middle, what I would call the middle occipital gyrus. But both the cuneus and the lingual gyrus had tumor. This is not a focal tumor. If you get inside the brain here, you're going to see pieces of the tumor with pieces of normal brain. So if I want to operate this, if you, if you operate, if you want to operate this case, you want to do an occipital lobectomy. And to do an occipital lobectomy, you're going to be open this syncytial, you're going to be caught in this connection of graciolet, coming to the inferior, to, 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 to this, I call interoccipital gyrus, interoccipital sucus, and remove completely the occipital pole. So if you see the patient sitting position, this is the last case I'm showing. This is the sagittal suture, this is the lambda suture, this is the lambda. So my parietoccipital sucus is right here. This is right here. Right, occipital sucus is right here. Opistocranium, calcan fissure is right here. Inium, my lingual gyrus is here, and my cuneus is here. So I know exactly where the tumor is. I see this big vein running over this incisure here, and I open the incisure, and I see the parietal connection of, of Graciolet here, parietal occipital connection. If I cut this connection and come here to the inferior frontal, inferior interoccipital sucus, I'm going to remove completely the occipital pole. You see how deep is the parietal occipital sucus, how deep it is? And then you can do a beautiful resection of the occipital pole in this lady that had all tumor here. And of course, this is calcan fissure. This is lingual gyrus, okay? And this is what was left of the anterior aspect of the lingual gyrus that had no tumor. And you can see here that we were able to do a beautiful resection of the occipital pole anatomically oriented. I think I'm gonna stay by here. I had another case, but uh, I'll stop here for the sake of time. Thank you all very much. And if there is anything you can discuss, uh, I'll be uh, of course uh, glad to uh, talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rebus. Can you stop sharing your presentation? Do you know if you are like me, you wanna, here again and again and again. It's very easy. Just go to the Cambridge, to the Cambridge University. You can get the book of Professor Rivas, and so you can see here. Before the people ask me, I don't have the, the PDF, okay? <laughs> you need to get the book. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Professor Rivas. Wonderful presentation. But uh, in glioma surgery, in, in, in intrinsic brain tumors, is, the anatomy we know that is is crucial because the technology not always is there to help you but you need to know also the function and you mix the anatomy in the physiology and the function and there is no better guy in the world that can mix this than professor lorenzo bello from milano professor lorenzo bello is professor and chairman of the university of milano he trained in Italy. He did his fellowship in Brigham Women's Hospital and went back to Milano in the, a beautiful, beautiful center of neuro-oncology. Professor Lorenzo, thank you. Thank you very, very much to take your time for us. Now in Milano is 4 p.m. See, I hope you are in better situation. Brazil now is not so good. I think Italy now is much, much better. I hope. And thank you, Professor to take our time first. Please, go ahead. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's a great honor for me and to share 
what we are doing every day in uh, our daily practice. I hope to give you some insight of what we are doing and uh, particularly for the treatment of low-grade gliomas that, as you can see, is a great part of uh, our activity that is mostly on uh, uh, brain mapping. So just to go directly on what we are doing, what do you have to do when uh, you see a patient with a, a presumptive low grade in your outpatient clinic? The first question that you have to ask yourself is the feasibility of surgery. And this, of course, depends on the onco-functional balance, which is a product of the uh, functional reorganization of the unique individual brain. To understand that, you have to look at the, to the patient and to the tumor. Uh, take a lot of uh, care of looking at the patient, asking the clinical history, the duration of the clinical history, particularly the type of seizure history, because this is telling you which type of uh, tracts and circuits are, has been reorganized or are un under pressure. Uh, of course, you have to look at the education and jobs and needs of the patient and take a lot of care on neuropsychological evaluation and psycho-oncological one. This is the type of studies that we are doing in the preoperative period. And the neuropsychology mainly is telling you uh, which type of circuits and functions has been reorganized and which one uh, are not. And on the same time, thanks to the psycho-oncology, you look at the patient needs. And so you, have, you can organize a, a surgery according to the patient needs. Then you have to look at the tumor, looking to the volume, the speed of growth, the numbers of lobes involved, and the contralateral extension. Of course, you can add fMRI and DTI. And we have also adding uh, metabolic imaging to get proper uh, tissue for the correct histological and uh, also molecular diagnosis. Then you put all this information together and you have an idea of the level of uh, preoperative reorganization in the brain. So you can have an estimation of the feasibility of the uh, resection. When this is done, the uh, surgical strategy is to define the um, strict relationship between the tumor and the functional binderings using interoperative neurophysiology and the neuropsychology as a guidance. The concept is to resect till the functional boundaries are, uh, of course, located in independently from the tumor border. Therefore, you have a border that can be inside of, of the tumor, the functional border inside of the tumor, so you get a partial resection, or the functional border are at the tumor border according to the MAR, and then you have a total resection, or outside of the tumor border, and then you have a supratotal resection, which is the main goal of uh, our surgery. Um, and this, of course, influence the mapping and the anesthesia strategy during uh, the specific resection. The cortical mapping is quite quick because you have to define the point of entry. And then most of the work is done at the, the subcortical mapping, which produce a functional tumor di disconnection. This is what we are doing, in fact. We are working at the tumor periphery since the beginning, and we kept, in fact, large part of, of the tumor inside, and we disconnect the tumor. And this is the strategy in terms of uh, timing and, of course, anesthesia. The first step is asleep. The way part to disconnect the tumor from the main functional boundaries that require the patient to be awake, then to use intraoperative neurophysiology for the last part of the surgery till closure. Of course, when you want to, uh, to keep functions, functions are many. Therefore, you have uh, just the pure, the pure motor function, but you have also all the other functions that uh, combine the terms cognition. So you have language, memory, social interaction, emotions, and so on. 
and the preservation of all these functions is important for the for the full patient functional integrity and this uh, influence the bony flap and patient positioning that should include the tumor area the critical vascular supply the functional landmarks for establishing the working current the functional boundaries to be reached this is that some example of the position that we've been using for the SMA, the frontal and the uh, insula, for the middle temporal tumor and for the posterior tumor. Um, when we came to brain motor mappings, the aims are to define and to identify essential motor tracts and areas and to preserve the motor function. Then the problem starts immediately because when we define the motor function, it's very difficult. Motor function can be simple or multiple muscle contraction, but also to perform a motor skill or to learn a motor skill or to tailor a motor skill to a specific action. And so you have different level of uh, complexity. To understand this in the anatomy, in the function anatomy, you have to uh, think that the cortex control the spinal cord by many descending volleys. The most important one is the corticospinal tract, which has important features, not only in one as an origin, many, many areas, and you have to take account of, about that. Second, the number of uh, fibers quite large, and most of them are, are in fact very small, and the termination of the spinal cord widespread. So how to investigate this in the theater? It depends on the area and subsystem that you want to look. We have to use the appropriate test or task, and we have to use the appropriate neurophysiological protocol. The basic is that to have the patient in resting conditions, then you apply the, the neurophysiological paradigm at the cortical level to identify the primary motor cortex and to define the point of entry where to perform the corticectomy. At subcortical level, you have to identify N1 fibers, and these define the um, resection margins and the extent of resection. In terms of uh, neurophysiological tools, you have mapping tools, high frequency technique, and the low frequency technique, the pain field, uh, and you can use both the monopolar probe and the bipolar probe with both. And then the monitoring technique with the MEP monitoring, from, a D, from the DCS, SCCP monitoring, ECOG, and EEG. We have been using um, a large wiring of the patient to have a EMG and free running EMG is very, very important because um, you can monitor it at the same time, different body segments, IPSI and contralaterally. You can reduce the current intensity and you can detect impending seizure due the uh, stimulation or during the surgery in any case. This is the typical example of the uh, different tools that we are using during the surgery, free run EMG, ECOG, transcranial uh, MEP, the MEP from the cortical strip, and then the uh, SCCP and the motor bot potentials. The basic for the motor mapping is to define the motor threshold which is the lowest current intensity that gives the lowest EMG response. And this is a product of the excitability of the primary motor cortex. Mainly, it tells you how the system is working, and it depends on the clinical context. This is due to the fact that um, many functions, many clinical functions can change and one excitability. Um, part coming from and looking to the patient, part depending on the tumor. And of course, when you are at subcortical mapping, again, the subcortical motor threshold tells you how far you are from the fibers. Uh, when you have a tumor like this one, in which the cortical spinal tract is just push uh, and uh, displace posteriorly, both techniques, both uh, high frequency and low frequency, so the painful technique are working and you can get very low threshold at subcortical level, two or three milliamp, and this is quite safe 
the chance to induce permanent deficit is very low, almost zero. When you decide to use a low frequency technique, this technique is mostly working in awake uh, conditions because the amount of current intensity that you get, you have to use in the sleep is quite high. But even in the awake setting, you can end up in a situation like this one, in which you apply the probe, the bipolar probe over the cortex, and with the two milliamp, you get a um, um, focal seizure. Or you can end up in a situation like this one, in which no motor response are evoked, and the only way to get and to, con and to continue the mapping is to use a high frequency technique. Um, the second drawback of the um, low frequency technique of the pain field is the fact that when you get and you find a motor response at the cortical level, the chance to induce motor deficit is quite high. And in fact, um, you have uh, at least a 10% of uh, chance to induce any type of motor deficit, usually mild, when you get a motor response at the subcortical level with this technique. And this is due mainly to the feature of the technique. In fact, you are using quite focal probe, which is the bipolar one, and particularly the features of the paradigm, which is characterized by a bipolar um, pulse that is, uh, is uh, given, delivered every 20 milliseconds. So you need a lot of time to charge the accents and to get a motor response. And therefore, when you get one, you are in fact over. And this is explaining you the reason why you get a higher chance to induce deficit. In all the other cases, um, in, all the, in most of the cases, in fact, high frequency technique, the pulse technique is the more efficient system to excite N1 fibers. And also you get uh, an estimation of the distance because you can perform a core intensity curve and by the relationship to one million, one uh, uh, million pair, you can get online an estimation of the distance from the stimulation site to the N1 fibers. Of course, if the excitability of N1 is uh, of course correct. You can also increase focality changing from the monopolar probe to the bipolar probe, so you get less type of response, more focal response, particularly at the cortical level. And then in difficult cases like this one, which you have a, a previous treatment, radiosurgery, and the excitability of the fibers and of the system is very low, you can uh, increase the charge by increasing the number of pulses or even um, increase in the pulse width, and so you can perform the mapping in most conditions. This is the reason why um, to, to talk about negative mapping with a high frequency, it's very it's, uh, it's almost impossible. The other advantage of the technique is the fact that uh, besides qualitative data, so the type of muscles activated that is the same as low frequency technique, you can get quantitative data, which is the latency, for example, and the amplitude, and you can estimate these uh, online for your specific surgery. So the basic is low frequency in awake patients and qualitative data, and the use is limited in case of premium treatment, motor deficit, infiltration of the corticospinal tract and edema and risk of intraoperative seizure, high frequency is working most of the condition. You have an estimation of the distance and qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, the motor threshold that is considered according to the most recent literature as safe is between five and three million, but I will show that you can go even less. Um, some drawbacks. Uh, low frequency, the pain field is very easy to be used because you can look at the over movement. You don't need to have an EMG. The stimulator is very easy and you must, you just have the surgeon in the theater. On the contrary, when you have the high frequency technique, you need an EMG for the correct uh, response. 
uh, interpretation and showed, and you need to have a more complex EOM machine, a neurophysiologist or a technician in the theater, and the surgeons must be trained in uh, neurophysiology. The question is, to um, do that is enough to preserve the motor function, not, uh, not really. Look, this case, it's a frontoparietal low grade. I did this case many years ago in uh, sleep anesthesia with all this protocol that I showed you just some minutes ago. And we were get very close with a mon monopolar probe and the bipolar probe. You see the cortical strip over assessing the integrity of the cortical spinal tract from one every second. And we were able to get a fantastic resection and to keep a motor response still at the hand. The patient waking up, no motor deficit, but severe apraxia. And the patient was not able to recover most of this apraxic deficit. Just to tell you that to look at N1 is not enough to preserve motor function. In fact, particularly in human, the contribution of non-primary motor area to define the uh, end and the, the end and motor dexterity is increasing and is very important. So you have to assess. Uh, also the contribution of not primary motor areas to the cortical spinal tract. How you can do that in the theater? You have to use the appropriate task. You have to uh, use the appropriate stimulation paradigm. It depends on the circuits that you have to look at and the task and to use the appropriate tools to detect the type of interference that you are inducing. Example is the grasping network. This is the grasping network uh, described in the monkey. You see N1 just is just the last effector and all the other circuits and areas that are in fact involved and that you have to look at in the surgery. We are doing this in the theater, uh, asking the patient that uh, is awake to perform an end manipulation task, which is um, which in fact uh, recapitulate the haptic test that has been used in the monkeys for many times. And the patient is rotating the uh, screwdriver with, with, uh, without any uh, visual guidance. And we are looking to behavioral changes induced to the stimulation and also to the change in the, that is possible to look at the EMG level. Why this is important to combine EMG and also uh, behav behavioral changes because you, you can see here that a movement arrest can be due to a complete abolishment of uh, uh, any muscle activity, but the same is due to an increased muscle activity. Therefore, you are in fact with the same behavioral uh, interference looking to different effect. And it is important to use when you have a tumor that is uh, involving at least two centimeters in front and, and behind the, the primary motor cortex. And you can induce different types of interferences at cortical and subcortical level. And when you keep these sites, you dramatically decrease the chance to develop uh, idiomotor apraxia in the postoperative period. This is very important because uh, you look at the difference when you are using this easy task that is in fact not adding a um, lot of time during the surgery, just 10 minutes, even less, it, the chance to develop apraxia is 2.5% and the needs of rehabilitation is, is almost uh, zero. So this is very, very important. Last uh, hints about motor mapping when you are approaching the primary motor cortex. Most of the, of the information that we know about the primary motor cortex came from low frequency technique, the painful technique data, and particularly the typical somatotopic map of each body division that has been largely uh, known and also described. When you are using this technique, the painful technique, look at the paper from the San Francisco group, um, 
this is working quite nicely at the cortical level, little bit less at subcortical level, 70% of motor responses. And in fact, in a low frequency um, technique paper, you can see the terms of uh, negative mapping. So you increase the current intensity and you get any motor response. So you are considering negative mapping when you are doing this and you didn't get any motor response is a sort of a failure of the technique. And the extent of resection is a complete resection is a 50% um, severe deficit permanent around 10%. When you go to the high frequency technique um, with the standard technique, that is the train of five, you get 72% uh, of complete uh, resection and the permanent deficit is around 2%. Two, 2%. And this is particularly working in case of tumors like this one. Uh, failure, in fact, when you are dealing with the, the low grade setting. To address this type of tumor, in fact, you have to add to the qualitative data, that is the type of muscles uh, that are activated by the, stim the stimulation, quantitative parameters, MEP amplitude, the current intensity, the latency, and the morphology. In fact, when you are using this information, you see that in the hand knob, the types of motor response that you can get are quite complex. And the organization, the functional org organization is definitely more complex than what you can get with the low frequency technique. And you have, uh, for example, motor neurons that are uh, firing for five stimuli or even less. And then you have also to be aware that you have two functional uh, area, one at the anterior and one at the posterior border, and the posterior is more excitable than the anterior one. And when you combine all this information during surgery, you can extend the resection. And by using this in the low grade setting, uh, where that standard technique in fact is failing, you can increase the extent of resection and keeping the permanent deficit quite low, just to show you an, an example with a, a successful, a, a almost complete resection in this area. And this is the reason why we change a little bit, incorporating all this information, our attitude, and we start to increase the number of patients in which the surgery was performed awake, even in the not dom dominant side. In fact, it's uh, quite easy to assess all the, these functions when you are in the dominant side because you have uh, the cognitive function to be seen, to be um, identified, but also the not dominant side is full of functions. So which one is the right patient to be awakened up when you are operating on in the not dominant side? We address this, and this is a paper on, that has been accepted and under press in uh, GNS, in which we investigated in not dom dominant side, a group of patients uh, to investigate which clinical factors were in fact guiding the, the best uh, result in terms of extent of resection and permanent deficit. From that, we develop a, a motor mapping score that we validate in a prospective series. These are the tumors of the retrospective series and the prospective series quite that were performing the wake and the sleep. And you see no much difference. These were the, in fact, the factors that were uh, found in the retrospective series. You see that the best in the wake setting is, the, is when the tumor is large and invading the frontal parietal network. So the praxis network is involved and the patient has no preoperative deficit or a previous treatment. In, instead, the best sleep in a small tumor with a previous surgery and uh, the uh, involvement of the uh, praxis network is very limited. And by doing this, we then develop a score that was in fact um, validated in the prospective series and invite you to read this paper and it's quite useful to um, guide 
in the in the choice of performing the mapping asleep or awake. Of course, when you have to look at the, all the most all the other functions, you have to have the patient awake. For the cognitive mapping, the basic standard is the low frequency technique and to establish the current intensity of the working current over the premotor cortex. We are using different type of task and you see that according to the site, there's not much difference because in fact the circuits are always the, the same independently of the lobe. Um, if the, the low frequency technique is not working because of a long history of seizure or epilepsy or radio cases or after chemotherapy or radiotherapy, you can use a high frequency technique, just increase the repetition rate from one hertz to three hertz. And when you are doing this, you save your patients because the chance to get permanent deficit is very low, but the most difficult function to keep are uh, the highest functions, executing function, and of course, memory, mentalization, empathy, and mood. And this is the field of research that we have been doing since the last five years. For example, we are looking to uh, emotions in the theater, asking the patient to perform an emotional uh, recognition task, looking specific threats in the insula, or uh, looking to the cognitive control and the ability of uh, interference. It is an important function because give you the ability to focus uh, despite of distraction. This is very important for intellectual jobs. And uh, um, of course, resistant to interference can be assessed in the theater by asking the patient to perform the stroop task. We, mod we modify the, the stroop task for uh, the uh, use in the theater. And when this uh, was used in a group of patients with a tumor in a not dom dominant site, we locate some uh, subcortical sites that were specific for these uh, stroop task interferences. They were in fact located uh, in the anterior part of the insula. And when we look at the tracts that were involved among all the tracts that were running over there, we looked at front, we found that the frontostriatal inferior tract was the most involved. So just to tell you that the connectivity in the deep of the insula is important in the maintenance of the executing functions and in the long term. This of course is important because uh, what we have to try to do is to move patients from the high risk to the low risk. So to get uh, as much as we can of the tumor and if it's possible even to, to go uh, out, uh, outside of the tumor margin. So to perform what is called supratotal resection that has an oncological rational, the fact that we have cells in the around of the MR tum tumor border. And because the tumor border are important because particularly for the seeds, for the seizure con uh, control. But the use of supratotal resection has some open questions, feasibility and safety in the clinical routine, uh, the, the putative factors, the functional impact, the oncological impact. The, uh, you see from our series that the feasibility and the general safety, it's quite high. At least 33% of patients has a supratotal resection in our series and the mapping time and the surgery time and the safety is the same uh, as the partial and, and, and the total. Uh, in terms of putative factors, any tumor, um, uh, any tumor factor that has uh, deductible from the preoperative MR are in fact involved. From the histomolecular data, just the grade two is involved. From the clinical history, uh, just a long clean clinical history. In terms of function, the uh, detailed neuropsychological assessment uh, at one week, three months and one year, show that is not, there is no difference between patients submitted to total and to su supra-total uh, resection. 
and in terms of impact on the quality of life, there is no difference on hospital anxiety and depression scale scores, and the seizure control is also longer. Looking to oncological impact, this was assessed in a different group of patients uh, that we op operated. And you, you see that, again, the total resection was around 40% and the supratotal 35%. The progression free survival uh, was observed in the 63% of patients. And most of the uh, progression were in the cavity. Among the factors that were, in fact, associated with the progression free survival, the most important one was the extent of resection. And the supratotal resection was, in fact, associated with the, a fantastic and dramatic con, uh, control. Just 5.4% of patients develop a uh, recurrence, and the progression free survival was longer than 92 months and was independent of the tumor grade. And the histomolecular profile was assessed in the random foster analysis and particularly in the propensity score match in which the benefits of, of the supratotal in terms of progression-free survival was finally clearly uh, shown. Um, supratotal also impacted on the uh, malignant transformation that was no difference in the total and in the partial and the subtotal. Instead, just one patient had malignant transformation. There was also an effect on a overall survival and particularly in the choice of the adjuvant treatment and particularly in the grade three tumor. Look that in the grade three, 41% um, of patients just was, were uh, observed and uh, radio and chemotherapy was uh, uh, done in 18% only, both in grade three astro and in grade three uh, oligo. Just to tell you that you can postpone radiotherapy and the effect of uh, radiotherapy um, by using this type of technique. Thanks. Can you can stop sharing your, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's an amazing presentation. Uh, you know, when you mix everything, the anatomy, physiology, makes things more visible and more understandable to the people. Let's continue the, the, the presentation and then at the end, we bring the discussion about the presentations. Um, our next speaker, I'm problem here with my computer, on just one second here, <laughs> okay. My, I lost my phone, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, our next speaker is Professor Grewal. Professor Grewal, from Mayo Clinic in Florida, in Jacksonville. And there is a new area that today you have a patient that comes with epilepsy and after you found out this is a tumor, there's a patient with tumor with, remain with epilepsy. In sometimes is a main point for the patient and for the family. It's important to discuss this. And thank you, Professor Gilbert, to be with, with us, please. Take your time, your, your screen is already shared. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Borba. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for the invitation to speak here. <clears throat> and uh, I'll be following two fantastic speakers, first talking about the anatomy, then we talked about the physiology. Now what we're gonna talk about is how to combine the two, but also look at some of the molecular basis of how we treat these patients. <clears throat> I have no <laughs> I have no disclosures. This is a figure that's probably well known by everyone. And on the left, what we see is this paper by Englot, where we look at 
the histology of tumors in adults, we know most commonly we see meningiomas, most commonly benign meningiomas, and then second is a combination of gliomas. However, when we look at which of these patients present with seizures, it's actually the gliomas, the intrinsic tumors that have a much higher seizure threshold uh, when we compare them to extrinsic tumors such as meningiomas and metastases. We know there's certain imaging findings such as increased flare signal and uh, edema, but <clears throat> when you look at two tumors right next to each other, it's very difficult to distinguish which patient will develop epilepsy or postoperative seizures and which will not. And the goal of our, our research is try to identify which patients would. Uh, going back to Dr. Bellow's talk, discussing further about doing super total or an epilepsy resection on top of an oncologic resection in these patients. How do you do that feasibly? And then finally, postoperatively, how do you treat them? So we know that in terms of quality of life, Kurnofsky performance scores, having seizures associated with your tumors leads to a worse quality of life, lower Kurnofsky uh, seizure score. And the other thing we know is that the anti-seizure medications we have don't work as well with patients who have oncologic seizures as they do with patients who have epilepsy due to secondary etiologies. It could be due to multiple thoughts here. So it could be due to individual variations in the medications or their metabolism. It could be dysregulation of the genetically mediated multi-drug transport proteins. It could be due to decreased drug target sensitivity. There's increased neuronal apoptosis, which could lead to uh, lower response of the medications. And then we also know based on fMRI data that there's reorganization of the neural networks and it's potential that the reorganization of the neural networks makes it more difficult to treat these patients. When we talk about multi-drug resistance proteins, we know that there's a specific one such as MRP1 and ABCC1, which are often found to be overexpressed in cancer, which makes the oncologic treatment difficult, but it also makes the epilepsy treatment difficult. Um, what this figure shows is that there's shared mechanisms that are involved in glioma cells as well as in epilepsy, specifically looking at glutamate hyperexcitability and increased glutamate response that could be a shared mechanism for having epilepsy in these patients. I just want to start with a, a case kind of describing how we handle these patients. Uh, this was a 58-year-old right-handed woman. She initially presented with some tingling in her hands in the perioral region. She underwent a surgical resection outside uh, institution and presented to be uh, WHO grade three astrocytoma. She then presented with now new weakness, recurrence, and uh, here we perform these awake. Let me just make sure the video works here. So there's a little positioning for these awake patients. Uh, we do scalp blocks beforehand. Um, we open the incision. The scar can often be painful, so you want to make sure it's well anesthetized. Uh, they had done a small uh, excisional biopsy, basically, from the previous uh, surgery. So we had to extend the craniotomy here. Uh, once we extend the craniotomy, we inject local along the vessels to prevent some of the pain associated with dural opening. We want to open the dura widely, uh, dissect through the previous scar tissue. You can see the recurrent tumor right there. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is a grid that was Maybe the here. Battery. Here we go. Now we're right. okay. Testing. Ready? When I say go, give me a good squeeze. Go ahead. Whoa. Okay, relax. Wait a minute and go. Harder, harder. Good and relax. Some baseline. So we're developing baseline. Good. Good. Exactly. You're up and down like that. Good. Perfect. Uh, prior to any simulation. Yep. Okay. Good. We've identified our positive control now. If you feel anything weird, please tell me, okay? Uh, and what we notice here is an after discharge. Uh,
and we're constantly monitoring for after discharges during our resections. Um, but then we're also looking for things such as high frequency oscillations, um, which are a surrogate for apoptogenic uh, tissue. So once the resection is complete, we try to identify those high frequency oscillations uh, circumferentially. Forward and backwards. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yes. Fine motors. So when we talk about molecular subtypes and to try to identify which of these patients are going to develop epilepsy, which of these patients are going to have seizures, this was a paper that looked at 10 patients with awake surgery for low-grade gliomas, and they recorded high-frequency oscillations. Uh, what was important here is that uh, the IDH mutant uh, tissues had much higher um, frequency of high frequency oscillations when compared to the IDH wild. Uh, there's probably two mechanisms at play here. Um, you know, one is that most likely the IDH mutants have been around longer, slower growing tumors. So it's potential that because of that, the brain around has developed more gliosis and that's secondary uh, epilepsy from that. But also from a molecular standpoint, uh, IDH1 reduces alpha ketoglutarate to D2 hydroxyglutarate, which is molecularly very similar to uh, glutamate. And we think that that D2 hydroxyglutarate uh, acts as a surrogate on the glutamate receptors and relates to the excitability and the epilepsy in these patients. So, you know, this is the classic uh, way people map, uh, which is done over and over again. The issue we have with mapping with this, and I think as surgeons, one of the, the difficulties of mapping with this is once you've mapped, now you have to remove the grid to do your resection because the grid is in place of your core economy and your leaching. So what we developed is a circular grid uh, and this was a, a patient we used uh, the circular grid on. What's advantageous to this grid is that we can continuously resect while, um, while mapping, but also looking for after discharges, looking for high frequency oscillations when we're trying to do a supertotal resection. Um, so what we know is that <clears throat> this gives you significantly increased numbers of uh, electrode contacts, we have 20 contacts that we're continuously modeling from in a circular uh, fashion. Uh, we had increased extent of resection, uh, and when we had deficits, the mean time to resolution of those deficits was smaller because we were making sure that patients weren't developing significant seizures as well as uh, after discharges in this grid. When we look at glioma surgery, specifically periurolandic gliomas, what we found was that in 57 patients, the only thing that really predicted uh, intraoperative seizures was whether we had positive mapping. And I think that has a relationship to do with Dr. Bellows' talk about low frequency versus high frequency mapping and seeing if there's ways we can um, alter our mapping strategies in an attempt to reduce those intraoperative seizures. Uh, this was another manuscript which revealed that preoperative seizures were the only predictive uh, prognostic factor for postoperative seizures. We looked at multiple different things in terms of tumor volume, tumor location, extent of resection, grade of glioma. But this goes back to the need of looking at more molecular subtypes and looking at the genetics of these tumors to try to identify if we can predict which patients are gonna develop epilepsy and have them have a more super total resection. Uh, another case that's similar was a uh, 32 year old right-handed gentleman. Initial presentation was epilepsy. It was identified to have an uh, IDH mutant oligo. He presented with radiographic regression, continued epilepsy, underwent a weight craniotomy for resection. This place. similar position to the previous patient. Let's 
skip through some of the opening here. Straightforward craniotomy. And we'll get to where we're going to be doing some of the mapping. Spanish and English. Here we go. And what we can see here is using the circular grid while we were operating, we were able to detect and drop and seizures. So, so one of the key features there, and I'm going to try to go back to this and, and pause it here, is okay. So what you see is that if you were resecting and you had already taken off your grid, you wouldn't necessarily detect that prolonged after discharge. Clinically, the patient didn't have a seizure, but they had a subclinical seizure. But also what we find is that using just a strip electrode to the side, when you talk to epileptologists, you know, if you're not measuring with an electrode over the area of epileptogenesis, you're going to miss a lot of these subclinical seizures. That's why having a circumferential a way to measure is advantageous over a traditional strip electrode. Uh, the last few slides here, I'm going to talk about how we think there's a shared um, pathogenesis of, of epilepsy in these tumor patients. So when we look at the cerebral cortex, an invading glioma cell extrudes glutamate via the cysteine glutamate transporter system. And this is an important system that has to do with, with its relationship to epilepsy. So this cysteine glutamate transporter system is preserved in glioma cells because it promotes synthesis of glutathione. That's a protective uh, molecule for glioma cells. However, because it's a transport system, what this leads to is extracellular glutamate concentrations are increased and you have more uh, glutamate in the synaptic cleft between the pyramidal cells. This leads to activation of the NMDA receptors leading to depolarization and excitations, which is what produces the epilepsy in these patients. In addition, you have postsynaptic calcium influx because of the depolarization, which leads to this cascade of uh, excitotoxicity which leads to cell death of the normal glial cells. So it's kind of a combination of things that are working together where the glioma cell to preserve itself is producing increased extracellular glutamate as a byproduct that extracellular glutamate not only releases um, the NMD receptor to promote epilepsy, but also leads to cell dependent uh, excitotoxicity. The other mechanism here is a little bit more involved, but this has to do with intracellular calcium, and that's because glioma cells, uh, and again, this explains why it's preserved in the glioma cells, because it helps in terms of proliferation and migration, but the byproduct of this is more seizures. So the glioma cells accumulate intracellular calcium due to an overexpression of a sodium potassium calcium uh, co-transporter called NKCC1. Uh, before they undergo mitosis, uh, there's a calcium uh, calmodulin dependent protein kinase activation. And what that leads to is uh, a loss of calcium from the cell. The loss of calcium really uh, leads to efflux of water with the chloride and that uh, results in cellular shrinkage. When the cell is smaller, it can migrate and, and it leads to easier division from the mitotic aspect of it. Now, GABA is released by <coughs> normal inner neurons and that depolarizes these glioma cells by leading to more chloride efflux. That chloride efflux then continues to help with migration as well as uh, hyperpolarization. Uh, once you start having cell death, you have activation of microglia and that releases BDNF. When you have BDNF released, uh, that contributes to further chloride dysregulation um, and further upregulation of that NKCC1 uh, co-transporter. This release 
to increase chloride, and that increased chloride is a depolarizing response, which can lead to epilepsy. So what all that means is when we're targeting things for treatment of epilepsy in oncologic patients, they're not necessarily the drugs you would use for a new onset epilepsy. So this is kind of a table which describes uh, the recommended treatment uh, option, which would be levetiracetam or valproic acid, and the second line therapy being a combination of the two. And when we looked at our series, what we found was that doing a dual therapy leads to a significant improvement in postoperative seizure controls, which is what we started to do in our patients who have preoperative seizures or intraoperative seizures. Uh, thank you all very much, and I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Grewal. Can you stop sharing your, I think, your, your presentation? I think Dr. Reba is here, Dr. Lorenzo is here, and you have some panelists, the moderators from, from the flank. The first one to introduce Dr. Fernando Martinez from Uruguay. He is the president of the chapter of oncology. Dr. G Gabriel Vargas from Colombia. And Dr. Barbara Netel from <laughs> Mexico. Claudia, porque está aquí Doña Maya. Por favor, que, que no es cortar todos los, mic los micrófonos, solo la gente que va a hablar. Eh, Vamos a empezar con el doctor Fernando Martínez, después Gabriel Vargas y Bárbara, y después de los tres podemos abrir las preguntas de concesión para todos los participantes. Ok, Fernando, go ahead. Can you, can you be in English? Uh, you can understand? Go ahead, Fernando. Fernando Martinez, are you there? He was here, he was there. Gabriel Vargas, are you here, Gabriel? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay, go ahead, Gabriel. Fernando was just talking to me, I don't know if that is his microphone. Go ahead, Gabriel, please. Okay, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much for allowing me to, to, to hear these three very excellent and uh, really modern concepts of anatomy, applications for surgery, neurophysiology, and also the association between epilepsy and brain tumors from Dr. Sanjit also. Uh, the three conferences, very, very unique uh, occasion in order to really try to understand what we need to do with the patients today. Uh, it's very important that we as a neuro-oncologist know right now, not only cortical uh, special areas, but also the borders of the tumors, the tracts, and try to apply that knowledge on each surgery. For us, it's very important to do a research in each patient in order to know what are the tracks and what we need to do in each patient. And of course, the awake surgery has a very important role in this uh, means, especially in glioma surgery. So congratulations for the three speakers, very excellent talks, and I hope, Dr. Borba, that we can review in detail these presentations, maybe at YouTube, as you mentioned, no? The, 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 the talks are, are yes, already all right. in, in, a, in a special. So thank you for the opportunity to see and to, uh, you know, all these three excellent speakers. We don't have nothing to add to, to that. Um, in order to, to, to say that very 10 by 10 uh, excellent talks, the three talks. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Fernando Martinez, are, are you back? I am here. Okay, go ahead, Fernando. <laughs> Nothing to add. Uh, all of the speakers are brilliant. 
So uh, I asked uh, the assistants uh, for questions. If you are agree with. Okay, okay, go ahead. Or I'm sorry to make a question for you. May I make one question? Do Dr. Lorenzo is online? I cannot see his picture here. Oh, Lorenzo is here. Dr. Lorenzo Bello and Dr. Ribas. Yes. And I make, I make the same question to you, to both, okay? Uh, today in glioma surgery, a lot of people talk about the super radical removal. See, for low grade and also to high grade. Is there a fact or it's a myth? Real, it's to change the, 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 uh, the, the course of the disease or just the anatomical removal of low grade run glioma as Professor Yashagil uh, always talk about and Professor Ribas show brilliant in his presentation is the goal of surgery. What's your opinion about this supra, tot, supra or radical, supra total, uh, supra marginal? I don't know how they say that. Please go ahead. Dr. Ribas and Dr. Bello, who we'll, we'll go first? <laughs> well, if you don't mind, I, I would like uh, not really to answer, but to complete your question towards Bello. <laughs> uh, well, number okay. one, uh, Congratulations to all of you and Lorenzo is always very nice to be with you. And let me point out uh, that Lorenzo is doing a unique work. You know, I think what he does is uh, almost more science than neurosurgery. Just a few people are ahead as, as he is uh, doing this level of physiology. And uh, uh, I, 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 in this direction, uh, uh, well, number one, let me just try to answer. I think, uh, I think there are a few articles that show this supratotal uh, removal. I see that your results of Lorenzo are pretty similar to uh, Dufault's findings regarding uh, to uh, postpone malignancy and uh, have a better uh, progression-free survival and maybe overall survival as well particularly in low-grade tumors. So we have to believe in this. I don't know, if, uh, this is not grade one uh, evidence, but I, I think we do have to believe in this and, and do when See? we can do it and we are, when we are able to do it. Now, uh, I think Lorenzo is gonna discuss this issue much better than I am, but I wanna just to address him, what would be the indications of awake surgery nowadays, in your opinion, for the non-dominant hemisphere, and particularly for SMA area tumors, awake, non-awake, and what do you see about the future? You think we're going to be doing more awake surgery, or are we going to be to have more knowledge to do less awake surgery? What, what do you think in, in this particular direction regarding technique of doing glioma surgery? Well, you know that we have been doing this type of surgery since many, many years. And from uh, we started to do this approach uh, at least 15 years, years ago, when we were considered like crazy men, we were mostly uh, myself and you in Europe doing this, uh, chatting every day and exchanging data. And I collected the data during all this period, and the data uh, are showing feasibility, oncological impact, but also problems. First of all, uh, I show you at the end of the talk the, the data about the large series, uh, 450 low grades that we collected and we deeply studied with the, all the neuropsychological evaluation and so on. And this data that has been published this year in uh, last year, actually in new oncology, clearly showed that when you are using this approach, you change the natural history, at least in terms of progression-free survival and malignant transformation. We also show that the impact in terms of uh, function is uh, 
the same as the total, but the natural history change and uh, current common uh, features that has been considered for performing, not performing this type of surgery as not really important. What is important is in fact, the level of uh, reorganization of the individual brain. So what the most of the efforts in fact has been to be put in understanding the level of reorganization. Therefore, uh, your question about to wake or not to wake depends on individual patient, depends on uh, uh, the natural history of the tumor, the type of functions that he wants to preserve, the type of jobs, the needs, the compliance, and so on. And the division between the dominant and non-dominant side is not really a big division because it depends again on the patient that you have. Particularly in Europe now, we are dealing with a large amount of patient that wants to keep as much as possible. And on the other side, when you are performing um, supratotal resection, uh, when we critically review the first part of our work several years ago, we saw that in fact, language was kept, motor function was kept, praxis was kept, thanks to all what I showed today. But the most important part that was difficult to keep was the high connecting functions. And on, on one side you, of the story, you are the fact that when you are doing this, you are in fact resecting and finding almost uh, three two tumor cell borders. On the other side, you are encountering a number of uh, problems in the postoperative period that can change the life of the patient because you have seen, you have at least uh, 180 patients that has no recurrence after almost nine years or 10 years of, of, of their lives. But if you go deeper in this individual patient, you are going to see that a part of them, particularly those that were operating at the beginning of the series, had executing problems, uh, cognitive problems in terms of uh, change of emotion, change of empathy, so six, seven years ago, we started this uh, cognitive function work to look in fact at how was possible to preserve this, first to assess this function in patients, second to how it was possible to preserve this in normal daily life. And this is the reason why we add to the standard neuro neuropsychological evaluation, the psycho-oncological one. This is anything new, but for example, if I talk with the breast oncologists and surgeons that we have in the Institute, in fact, uh, psycho-oncology is there. So we are not doing anything new. And on the other side, we need to have psycho-oncology with us to understand these different way of working of the mind. And to preserve this is very important because these are young people. And of course, all the information that I give you today refers to the lower grades patients. When you go to the high grades, well, I will say to the wild type, I do not have data yet. Uh, I think biology of the tumors of this two types of tumors are quite, is quite different. And this is the reason why we are getting more knowledge on the lower grade type, which in fact are tumors starting in one side of the brain and diffusing. It's more difficult to find this and to have data on the wild type, uh, type of tumors in which when you discovered they are already widespread tumor. So I, uh, when uh, I can give you some def uh, important data on the lower grade side, I do not have conclude, um, significant data on the wild type yet. If you ask myself, uh, if you ask me what I'm doing with the wild type, I'm 
trying to, to perform super total resection if I can, but I'm not pushing too much because you have to consider that the time required for um, recovery in the postoperative period after a supratotal resection is a couple of months. And then even in the uh, low, lower grade site, when you ask the patient to perform uh, radiotherapy after 30 and 40 days, radiotherapy is in fact uh, stopping uh, plasticity and uh, recovery. Therefore, you have to think about the fact that um, patients that are going under radiotherapy or they should be submitted to radiotherapy, they have less chance to recover. So when you are reaching important functions like emotion or like that, uh, the oncofunctional balance change. And this is the reason why I start at the beginning saying to you, that you have to adapt uh, the type of uh, um, surgical protocol to the individual patient, individual patient and individual tumor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Dr. Luis, Barbara Natel from Mac. Luis, we have two questions from the audience. Yeah. One for Professor let's see, Rivas. Let's see, let's see first, the, the, uh, Dr. Barbara, okay. I think. Barbara Natel from Mexico, he, he, he want to say something after we come back to the question, okay? Uh, thank you very okay. much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I want to congratulate the, the speakers for the excellent talks uh, that we have today. And I think the first two talks, Dr. Rivas and Dr. Bello, are uh, the most important part uh, that we have to take into account when we are planning a, a surgery. And also Dr. Grewald's uh, talk was very, very interesting. And I have a question for Dr. Bello. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, how often do you see a, a post-surgical uh, deficit, uh, neurological deficit uh, after the surgery? Uh, uh, even though when the patients come out from the operating room uh, without a deficit, how often do you see a, a delay if deficit after the surgery and how long does it take to recover uh, the, those deficits in the patient? Um, okay, thanks for the, for the uh, question. You have to divide between uh, immediate deficit and permanent deficit and also um, deficits that are, uh, you see, you can define as neurological deficit or deficit that can be looked and evaluated by neuropsychological evaluation. Um, just talk about neuropsychological uh, deficit, which is the most important part of, the, of our work. If you are performing, the surgery according to functional boundaries, the chance to get um, permanent deficit, to get um, a immediate deficit is very high. In fact, when you reach, when you reach uh, functional boundaries, you always induce Im immediate deficit. Uh, the fact that the patient is getting out without deficit is just telling the surgeon that he didn't reach, in fact, any functional boundaries. If uh, the patient has some deficit, this means that you reach the functional boundaries. Then you're going to see that most of the patient in uh, 30 days completely recovered. The chance to get permanent deficit, now it's 0.5%. And what is the reason of this? The reason is in fact not a failure of mapping. The main reason is ischemia. This is the real elephant in the room, in fact, because uh, when you are performing postoperative MR, immediate postoperative MR, the most important part that you have to look at is uh, DVI. And you assess the amount of ischemic changes that you may have induced. This is the reason why your surgery 
as to, in fact, to spare most of the uh, vessels, particularly the smallest one. This is the reason why you have to add as much as you can to uh, avoid ischemia. So uh, to use the bipolar very cautiously, to respect the PL layer, to respect as much as you can in individual vessels, if, uh, particularly the smallest one. Even you are, if you are doing this, you may find that part of the, your patient in the post-operative MR are going to develop small ischemic lesion. And large part of these are going to be recovered. Part of them are in the course of important tracts. And these are the, um, are in fact those that are developing uh, post-operative neuropsychological deficit. And if you look at this, uh, at three months, most of the deficit are almost, almost recovered. Neuropsychological rehabilitation helps a lot and can in fact improve a lot the uh, patient recovery, of course, in the low grade setting. Uh, this is the reason why I'm changing the surgery and the approach. If, as I said before, I know that the patient has to go through radiotherapy within 40 days from surgery. I'm not pushing too much to put the patient at risk of uh, developing post-operative ischemia because I know that this, that this individual patient is not going to have the time to recover. In terms of recovery of deficit, the most difficult one is language. In the wide part, of course, language in terms of uh, lexical retrieval and the most, so, uh, the most uh, uh, sophisticated one, particularly in the multilingual patients. Go ahead, Fernando. I have some question. Fernando, please. Fernando okay. Martinez, can you, can you read the question? There? Thank you very much. One question is for Professor Rivers. Have you any anatomical or topographical tips for surgery of pure posterior superior insular tumors? And for Professor Bello, what task do you recommend for cognitive assessment of motor function? I'm sorry, what tumors posterior insular? No, if, if you have some anatomical or topographical tips for tumors located in the posterior superior insular region. Well, this is a very tough uh, business. This is the most difficult part of insular tumors. It's much easier to do when they are more anterior. Uh, Just pray. I, uh, personally, I came mostly from vascular surgery. I did many years just vascular surgery in the Spaldas Clinicas here. Was very much influenced by Gilberto Machado de Almeida and after Evandro de Oliveira, who was a particular friend and mentor of myself. And I did all insular tumors to start with uh, Transylvian. And uh, this posterior part is very difficult because you cannot enlarge very much the fissure. It, it's closed and you're dealing with the deep structures, the posterior arm of the capsule and everything. So uh, after a lot of uh, understanding, I, I do agree with going transopercular. So I think it's the best place to go to, to do with these tumors. So you're ready to have to understand the anatomy of the posterior part of the fissure of the base of the supramarginal of the post central gyrus and uh, of course of the central core itself. Uh, once you get inside there, there are no specific landmarks. I think uh, mapping and, uh, and neural navigation, it's definitely of much help. There's no particular, I bet maybe Lorenzo has um, more experience with these tumors as well. We'd like also to hear from him uh, any technical uh, remark he might do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Bello? I agree with, from what uh, Guillaume just said. In fact, um, this is one of the most difficult part of the, for the insular tumor resection. Um, listening to the patient is give, can give you some uh, 
and buys immediately if you can get there easily or not. For example, you may have to the same picture of uh, insular tumor in uh, two different patients. In one patient, the patient has a generalized seizure. In the second patient, he has a focal seizure starting with the speech arrest and followed by or not um, general seizure. In, in the first, the chance to have uh, the posterior part of the F3 that is not functional is very high. Therefore, your cortical landmarks is just the ventral premotor, uh, so the, the articulatory part of speech. And in the deep, you are going to find the uh, posterior part of uh, LSF3 that is functional in terms of uh, praxis and the arcuatus, which is quite deep. In this case, uh, you have a large, large uh, angle that can get you there and to the posterior part of the insula and you can resect this part quite easily. And in this case, large part of the IFOP is in fact not functional and just a little part can give you semantic paraphasia or semantic association task deficit. On, on the contrary, when you have a patient in which uh, these circuits are not completely reorganized, part of the posterior part of F3 is still functioning in terms of uh, articulate part of language, and therefore you have less access to this area. And one trick that I'm using in this case is to put the, the head like for uh, N1, uh, aneurysm, um, so quite, quite straight, just with a 20 degree angle. So I'm just going from uh, above and there is a sort of corridor from the anterior part to the, post to the posterior part in the deep that allows you to, to go there. But uh, I, I agree that is a very difficult uh, part, particularly in this specific patients in which the level of reorganization is not too high. In terms of the question that you asked you, you ask me before, which type of uh, task, uh, well, uh, which type of uh, as assessment that we, we are using, we are using uh, an assessment of the plastic circuits and uh, associative uh, motor cognition part um, that are specific for the um, Italian um, patients. Because again, neuropsychological evaluation should be, should, uh, should be validated in your group of patients. So the in invitation for you is to look, in, to ask to your neuropsychologist to go into the uh, Latin America uh, literature and to find uh, the correspondence ta task that we are been using. For example, we are using the uh, Spinner Tononi task, which is used in most of Europe, particularly for the Latin speaker. Uh, for the interoperative assessment, um, you have to divide the motor cognition part in, in two portion. One that is uh, under under visual guidance and one is not. At those that is not, you can use the hand manipulation task that I showed you before. It's just an, a pure optic task without vi visual guidance. For the visual guidance part, you can use the line bisection, which is quite a com complicated, or a reaching task. Both, both of them are helping in uh, sparing ideomotor apraxia and visual constructive uh, apraxia, which are two different parts of uh, the praxis functions. I, I think the participation of the residents of neurosurgery is crucial for the flank. And so Dr. Gerardo Guinto Nishimura, the president of the chapter of residents in the flank, wants to make a comment and an answer. Go ahead, Gerardo, please. Please. Uh, doctor, uh, well, congr and congratu congratulations to the three speakers. Uh, I think today we had more than 400 assistants, most of which I'm sure are residents. 
And we particularly enjoyed this session because it started with important anatomical basis and then reviewed the surgical aspects in glioma surgery, a uh, very comprehensive webinar. Uh, Dr. Riva's lecture in particular, uh, I think it changed my perspective on anatomical landmarks and brain sulci, reinforcing the concept that anatomy is really the best na navigation tool. Regarding this uh, remark, I would like to ask Dr. Rivas, how confident do you think we can be? Uh, um, yeah. yeah, how confident do you think we can be to aim for a supra total or supra marginal resection using these anatomical landmarks in non eloquent regions, particularly? Thank you, Dr. Well, it's, it's interesting that when we talk anatomy, people have a trend to understand that we are only using anatomy. Uh, I always say that uh, in order to understand history, you have to know anatomy. But the things are completely complementary. You know, they, 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 they have to go along. Now, in order to put a craniotomy to recognize the brain so side, you have to have, you have to use the tips, the sucral key points I talked about. And uh, they can guide the surgery because we are talking here to hundreds of surgeons in this seminar. We know that we have thousands of surgeons around the world. Most of the world is not this well developed. We are here in a seminar having this opportunity to have Lorenzo Bello who was unique in dealing with this, uh, this type of brain mapping that he's doing. So I, I would say that most surgeons in most part of the world, they would have to rely very, very much on anatomy. And we have to be humble to understand that most places in the earth will not be able to do a supratotal resection in ideal terms that we are talking about here. So in my behalf, I would say anatomy is very, very important overall. It's, it's the starting point. I think then come function. But to do function, you then have to know how to, to, to obtain this, this data. You have to have a whole set. It's not, a, it's not as, to do anatomical surgery, you can do it by yourself. It's the surgeon that it's gonna be doing. Now, to do what Bello is saying, it, it takes 10 people in the, room, in, in, in the room to get this thing done. You have to have neurophysiologists, you have to have a lot of things. Fortunately, I do have here, but uh, many, many people don't have it. But again, now coming back to your questions after these remarks, I think that nowadays we have data showing that in low-grade glioma, supratotal resection can be of great help. And of course, we are going to uh, understand, we're gonna be dealing with function and anatomy together. We have to know where we are, at least to understand the data we are obtaining from the patient and to, to document it. But uh, we, we have to have the facilities to have this done. I think, of course, one thing doesn't go against the other. So I think anatomy can help you in the supratotal recession. You, you have a patient in the supramarginal gyrus tumor and you wanna go to the anglo gyrus uh, region, you have to recognize where it is. So things are completely complementary in these terms, I understand. I, I hope I can uh, have answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you, sir. Barbara Natel continues with the questions that's coming from the chat. Yes, there is a, a question from Byron Alexander Sandoval. Uh, I think it's for Dr. Bello. Uh, what about transphase opercular resection plus opercular transfer supramarginal resection with a previous motor mapping in this type of tumors in non dominant hemisphere? That is the question. Uh, let me see if I understood the question. So, that in a case, uh, transphase opercular. Uh, resection, trans supramarginal resection in uh, a patient, in a recurrent patient. This is the, the question. Is this the question? I, I think so. Uh, I, I understood that too. Okay. Uh, there's no big difference in terms of approach between a primary case and a, a recurrent case. Uh, again, you have to look at the recurrent case in terms of uh, 
um, level of uh, on, uh, of uh, functional reorganization and level of uh, previous treatment. If you have a previous surgery, for example, only, uh, the brain is mostly working the same. So the chance to get a supratotal resection is quite high. If uh, uh, you are dealing with a patient that had a previous surgery, but with a previous adjuvant treatment and particularly radiotherapy, the chance of inducing uh, postoperative ischemia and the, lab and the level of um, postoperative reorganization and the plasticity is uh, uh, decreased. So you have in this second group of patients more chance to induce little uh, ischemia, which can in, in fact uh, impact on uh, the postoperative deficit, particularly at the neuropsychological level. Second, if you are performing a, a large supratotal resection, you have less chance that the patient is recovering in uh, one or two months, but the patient is going to take at least three to four months to be back at the, at the preoperative level. Of course, you have to adjust your approach to what the patient has to do. For example, if the patient has to go through a second irradiation, you cannot push as much as you can. You can still perform a supratotal resection, but not so large as you can expect. I think uh, Miroslava Soriano, the president of the student's chapter, wants to make a simple question. Go ahead, Miros, please. Hey, um, first of all, thank you all for your um, excellent talks. Uh, we're learning a lot. And um, to Dr. Velo, I wanted to ask him um, how important is for students that are preparing already from um, medical school to get into neurosurgery to start studying neurosciences? And what can we do? What specific advice would you give us? Well, um... I can say you what we are doing in uh, here about that. Um, uh, the neuroscience course has uh, formal teaching plus um, practical, well, out, um, not frontal type of teaching. And in this case, the students are uh, invited to spend uh, time in uh, the um, uh, neurophysiology lab in the neuropsychological uh, groups and in uh, uh, out, outpatient clinic on, on the floor to learn all this type of stuff. Uh, but of course, um, it depends also on the specific interest of the individual student. If you want to do that uh, specific training in uh, interoperative neurophysiology neurophysi is, uh, of course, uh, important. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Miroslava. I think Dr. Gabriel Vargas, right, raising his hand. He want to make yes, a question, uh, Doctor. I, I, yes, I, I see two questions on the audience. Uh, they are talking about uh, what would be the use right now of uh, fluorescence, uh, uh, that means of 5A, LA, or uh, sodium fluorescence. But also I want to add this question. When we review the Cochrane reviews about what is the use of technology, and I know that you three use a lot of technology in spite of the knowledge of anatomy, how we can improve the evidence of that kind of things that we are talking about, neuromonitoring, all of that things. Are we in place of do something in order to increase the evidence? I mean, control and not to do monitoring in one patient and do monitoring in other. Are we in place of that? Because many of the auditors here in Colombia, for example, if we ask for monitors and things like that, they, they say, no, the evidence, the evidence is so low. So are we 
prepared to do to increase the evidence in order to say, okay, this is really a uh, good quality of decisions and the supra total resection would be the best choice because we compare this with this, are we place of that? Or this is not ethical. I mean, it's not ethical to do some study like this. I don't know if, if you three understand what I'm talking about. Let's bring Dr. Grio to the to the to the discussion here. He's so quiet there. <laughs> oh, I'm just uh, listening with interest. These have been fantastic uh, questions. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the biggest issues we have with neurosurgical disease in general is that every case is so unique that to compile the number of cases to have a Cochrane level review would be an international multi-center study. And I think that's one of the reasons we fail to really show with level A or class one evidence that these things are beneficial. And if you look at the neurosurgical literature across the board, not just in tumors, but everything's pretty much level three evidence. Uh, and so when we get pushback uh, from our medicine colleagues or neurology colleagues, we say, well, look, you have millions of patients with the same disease process that you can study systematically. And I think Dr. Bello is doing a fantastic job of doing that. But even then, we're talking about hundreds of patients, not thousands of, or tens of thousands of patients. Uh, so that's kind of my two cents. You are now two hours and a half online here. I'll make one last question to the all the participants that you, maybe you can finish the webinar. Professor Soriano, just call me, <laughs> don't say too long. Uh, Professor Rivers, Professor Bello, Professor Gilwin. What is the future of the glioma surgery? What is the future, in your opinion, of the glioma treatment? What, what will be the whole of surgery in this particular pathology? Professor Rivers, please, those last remarks. <laughs> What's it? What do you think? Well, I think that as everything, uh, it's unpredictable. I, 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 I don't think we can be sure of what's going to be happening. But uh, despite the, the findings with the supratotal resections, we cannot forget that glioma is a diffuse disease of the brain. Uh, and what we are obtaining with good results is still bad results. We're talking about this patient living for some years. And if you look to our other cancers, you see that immunotherapy, you see the other type of therapies are coming to bring a better quality of life and a longer survival. I think that unfortunately, we will need uh, non-focal uh, treatments. We will need chemotherapy. We will need other treatments that will come and help us in surgery. Fortunately for us, I think that they will always need for us, us to get the specimens. And of course, re reduction of the tumor cytal reduction, uh, it's difficult not to make sense. But on the other hand, you take, you take for example, lymphomas, you take primary lymphomas. It doesn't make a difference if you remove them or not regarding therapy. Even some radiation tumors, uh, tumor, tumors can be radiated. I think that surgery is always going to, to play a, a big role but the final, uh, the final uh, therapies we're looking for are non-surgical. They might need surgery to be offered to the patient, but uh, we have to have, uh, to, to have some help coming from abroad, from other areas. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for participating. Dr. Grillo, there is yeah. a hope. There, there is a hope. I, I think there's a hope, and I think we as surgeons need to lead that hope. Uh, you know, I think... Super total resection is, is something that we all do and we think is helpful, but like Dr. Riva said, it's not curative in these patients, unfortunately. So how do we go to curative? And, and in the US, there's been a trend towards minimally invasive surgery, which is the opposite of super tensorial, right? So uh, for example, posterior superior insular tumors, most of those would be a laser ablation awake where your you know, patient has a little pinhole, you're doing it you have no approach related to morbidity. 
Now you combine that with things like biopsy. So you have biopsy, you can do a needle biopsy, gets to your tactic <clears throat> tissue, you can do a laser ablation, but then where does the role of assist surgeons come in? And I think that's gonna be targeted gene therapies and, and infusions. And that's why I think tumor molecular uh, markers are gonna be really important in the future. Thank you, thank you. Professor Bello. Well, I have to say that uh, the future is already here because uh, if I'm listening to the oncologist of the Institute, they are in fact asking us every time, uh, particularly in the recurrent case or in the first case to get as much as tissue as possible. And in the recurrent case, particularly after chemo and radiotherapy to get specimen all over in different places and different time of therapy. So the, the future is already there. In fact, that we have to adjust our strategy to give uh, uh, the type of response and the type to the answer that the medical oncologists are asking us. And in the era of the precision medicine, we have to think that precision medicine is of course molecular biology answer, but is, is also uh, precision medicine it is also to address the needs of the individual brain. So you have not to forget uh, the, the, the patient is a unique brain that is not, of course, molecular biology. So you we have to deal with a unique organ that is the, the brain that is completely different from uh, the other type of, of uh, uh, organs. So, so the neuro-oncology is different because you have to you have a tumor inside of a, a unique organ. So you, we need to address, in fact, both stuff. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. To end, let call Dr. Fernando Martinez, president of the chapter of Fl Amor? Neuro-Oncology of Flank. And after to, to end, the president, Dr. Soriano. Please, Dr. Martinez. OK. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you very much for, for the directive of the flank because of, of having these excellent talks. Um, I, I want to thank especially to Professor Carvalhiel Rivas because he's a, a Latin American neurosurgeon who puts the, the Latin neurosur neurosurgery in, in a high level. Also to our international speakers, Dr. Velo, your, your talk was very inspiring for us. Este, and thank you very much for all of the assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Presidente, now the president. Thank you, thank you, Borba. <laughs> On behalf of the Latin American Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, on behalf of the Flank University, I would like to thank uh, to the great speakers for today. Uh, I uh, sure, I'm sure everybody uh, learned a lot about the modern concepts of the gliomas. So uh, also I would like to thank the assistants, more than 400 assistants in Saturday is incredible. Uh, with this, I can uh, be sure that this educational activity was really a success. And I hope this can impact in the standard of care for the patients in the present and in the future. So thank you so much, everybody. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, gracias a todos.